everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, Seven Sales Presentation Fails and Fixes. I'm your host, Krista Moon, president of Moon Marketing, and we specialize in inbound marketing and sales techniques. I'd like to introduce to you our guest speaker, Julie Hansen. Julie is the author of two sales books, Sales Presentations for Dummies and Act Like a Sales Pro. She is a leading expert on what it takes to deliver a winning sales presentation or demo to today's busy audiences. And she has been named a top 50 sales blogger for three years in a row. Julie is the founder of Performance Sales and Training and has provided workshops and coaching to thousands of salespeople on six continents. In addition to her sales career, she's also worked as a professional actor, appearing in over 50 plays, commercials, and television shows, including HBO's Sex and the City. And she brings many unique tactics and insights from the world of performance into her programs. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Krista. And I wanted to say it was a PG-rated episode of Sex and the City, so let me just put that out there to start. <laughs> so you've probably seen some some fails on the internet, those misspelled signs that lead to confusion, bridges that lead to nowhere, and they're fails because even when the intentions are good, the outcome is often humorous or worse, disastrous. And today I'm going to talk about fails that salespeople make during their presentations. And these are those mistakes or poor decisions that can damage your credibility, distract you from your message, and ultimately even cost you the sale. And many of them we don't realize we're making. As Krista mentioned, I've had a front row seat to thousands of presentations, good, bad, and everywhere in between. And today I want to share with you the seven most common presentation fails that I see worldwide and how you can avoid or fix them. Now, for those of you that are here on time, I have a little bonus fail I'm going to throw in here. And I'm going to show you a slide of a presenter and just ask you to think about what, what is the fail here? So here's our presenter, looks like a nice fellow, he's smiling, pointing at uh, something that he's showing on the software, it doesn't have his back to the audience, that's good. So what is the fail? What is the fail? Well, as you might notice, he's standing in the light, and so we get these interesting shadow puppets, right? Uh, the logo across the chest. This is what I call a distraction fail. Now you may be thinking, big deal, that happens to me all the time. But here's the thing, this seemingly minor distraction actually takes your audience out of the moment and they can miss whatever point it is you're trying to make. There are certain things in our brain that we are attracted to and one of them is light and, and motion and things that aren't where they're supposed to be. And so this really speaks to that. So when I, when I see this happen, all I can think is, don't they know that they're standing in the light? And of course, as a presenter, you don't always know. I've made that mistake because you have a lot of things that you try to pay attention to. So let me give you a very easy, simple fix to this one, and it is duct tape. The answer to many of your problems is <laughs> as simple as carrying a roll in your briefcase. So get to your space early. Figure out where the projector light boundaries are and just put that little piece of tape at each of the edges. And that way, that will just remind you to kind of avoid that area. Now, it doesn't mean you can't go in the light at all, but if you do, you have to cross. Just cross quickly. Try not to be making an important point while you're you standing in front of the projector and cross as close to the projector as you can. All right, so now let's jump into our seven sales presentation fails and fixes. I'm going to show you some examples. Some I'm going to role play and ask you to guess what the fail is. And as I role play these, I want you to put yourself in the seat of your prospect and notice how it feels to be on the receiving end of these mistakes. You know, we don't often get a chance to experience that. This first fail is something I see in so many presentations and uh, it's right at the beginning. And I'm going to do this one as a role play. So let me give you a little setup. I've just been introduced, and I'm going to launch into my first slide here. Okay, so here we go. 
Well, thank you for that introduction, Krista. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my company. We're a leading financial services provider. We're based in LA. And we started out with three employees 36 years ago, and now we're up to 500 all over the world. We have three decades of experience in the industry, and some of our executives have served in leadership roles at major financial organizations like Ginny and Freddie Mac. We provide a variety of financial services, and our expertise in managing risk and compliances has proven invaluable for many of our 500 plus customers. And scene. Okay, so what is the fail here? Just, just think about that. So. So probably a, a couple things might come to mind. A little boring, sure. And I'll, I'll give you a, hint, a, a tip here. Most fails do make your presentation boring. That is, that is a big problem. Uh, a little bit of reading from the slide, which is tempting to do with slides like this. But the, the primary thing has to do with the, the focus of this slide. Who is this about? It's about me. It's what I call a company selfie. This slide or one like it is in almost every vendor presentation I see, and it's usually right up front. The entire premise of this slide directly contradicts your first order of business in a presentation, which is to engage your audience and create interest. Now, in this day and age, your prospect likely already knows or certainly has access to much of this information. You know, we're, we're hearing research that buyers are, are more well prepared by the time you come in than they have ever been in the past. So sure, there are key points you want to highlight for your audience, and there's a place for that, but it's not in the first few seconds or minutes of your presentation. So let's look at this slide a little more closely. Um, so we all know as salespeople, we should be talking about you know, calling out benefits, right? Well, this is a list of what? Features, right? So I'm headquartered in Los Angeles. Why do I care as a prospect? So what? Unless that means you're going to buy me lunch every day, <laughs> I don't know that, that I'm interested, that it matters. You have a diverse base of clients, over 500. You know, that might be important, but as it's stated, it's just a feature. So unless I turn that into a benefit, um, which means we have a great deal of experience to manage any, any challenges that you happen to face, um, or something like along those lines, it's just a feature, and it doesn't mean anything to my audience. So you may be thinking, gosh, what about credibility? I use this slide to, to give our, our company some credibility and to, to talk about you know, some successes that we've had. Let me share a quote with you that I think speaks to that. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, Teddy Roosevelt. So if you think about it, how much does your audience think you care at the beginning of a presentation when you start like that? Well, it doesn't sound like you care at all because you're just talking about yourself. Something on your chest doesn't give you credibility. In fact, doing it too early in your presentation probably leaves you open to more skepticism. You really need to earn the right to talk about how great you are with today's business audiences. Focus on delivering value in the beginning and your credibility will build quickly and naturally. So what's the fix here? I want to give you some alternatives to the dreaded company selfie. The first thing is to think about sprinkling relevant facts throughout. Don't dump them all on one or two slides up front. Uh, bring them up where, where you speak to that particular feature or benefit. Always apply that features benefits test every statement. For instance, if you say we have 1,000 employees, tell me why that's a benefit for me. Does that make you available 24-7 to address my needs? And here's a hint, if you can't find a benefit, leave it out. It's not important. If you have to have that slide in there, then place it at the end of your presentation after you've already established a connection and engaged your audience. And really what these slides are best for is as a leave behind. Maybe there are some facts in there that they need access to, and that's great. So the company selfie is really like that guy you meet at a networking event who, right after hello, just starts talking about himself and makes you wish he would go on to the next person. So don't be that guy. Don't bore people with your company selfie. Start off by showing some interest in their issues, their concerns, and their interests. 
This fail drives me crazy, and I know it drives busy prospects crazy as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to role play a very typical opening of a presentation. Uh, I don't have a slide associated with it, which, which isn't the fail, by the way. So I'm just going to do it on this slide here. I'm going to go into role and let you think about what is the fail here. Okay, so it looks like everybody's here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for that introduction, Krista, and thank you all for the opportunity to present to you today. My team and I are very happy to be here. I know you're all really busy, so I appreciate you carving some time out of your schedules and braving the weather out there. Gosh, it's really been raining. So uh, fortunately, it looks like it's going to let up a bit by the time we get done here. So anyway, we're here to talk about some of the ways we can help you accelerate your sales. Um, but before we do, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are as a company, as well as some of the other customers we've had the pleasure of working with. And scene. Yikes. That was a fail. And I want you to think about why that is. I was polite, right? I, I was trying to build rapport and start a conversation. That can't be wrong, can it? Well, let me, let me tell you what the fail I think is. So 20 seconds into that conversation, and I have yet to say anything that, of substance, anything that grabs your attention, speaks to your issues, or provides value. This is what I call a slow start fail. And starting off with a long prologue, a thank you speech, or a weather report are the wrong tactics today with busy business audiences. Also, we've done something very risky. Now, Krista introduced at the start here a poll about how long you think it takes to form a first impression. So, Krista, do you want to pull up the results from that poll? Sure thing. See, see, what, we, see what you guys thought. I think we had a, a couple of choices there. Uh, we had Can you see? three seconds. Yep, three seconds, seven seconds. Look like you're tied. Nobody thought it was seven minutes. Three seven seconds, seven seconds. Okay, good. So um, let me share the results with you. Seven seconds. So that's a, a, most of you got that, that it's a pretty short amount of time. Now think about it, seven seconds. That's not very long at all. But research shows that in seven to ten seconds, people decide some pretty significant things about you. They decide, are you confident? Are you likable? Are you trustworthy? Are you worth getting to know better? So what's happening in those first few seconds is your audience is, is choosing what lens they're going to listen to your presentation through. All right? So um, they're, you're setting their expectations. Now, what kind of expectations am I going to have as a, as a prospect if your opening is boring and long-winded? I'm going to expect it to be more the same. I'm going to expect it to be like every other presentation I've sat through. So a slow start can lose your audience very quickly. And as any good performer knows, if you lose your audience early, it is an uphill climb to get them back. So let's look at what the fix is to that slow start. And it is cutting to the chase. Think about how movies start. Do they start with a lot of backstory about the, how the characters met or where they went to high school? Did the director come on and tell you where they made the, why he made the movie? No, they start with the car chase or the lovers meeting. Um, they start with some type of compelling plot point or action to grab your attention. And that's a great place to start your presentation as well. So what is the chase in your presentation, you may be thinking? Well, that could be a key issue that your prospect is dealing with. Maybe it's a really interesting insight that you can bring to the table. Uh, maybe it's a benefit that you can entice them with. So it, it's something that you, you call out and it's going to make your audience sit up and pay attention. So what I'd like to do now is role play for you an example of a cut to the chase opening. All right, so I'm going to just dive in here. Again, I've just been introduced. Thanks for that introduction, Krista. You know, I know you have a kid in college, and I know some of the rest of you have uh, college-age children as well. So it's probably not a surprise to you to note that college tuition has actually doubled in the past 10 years. 
And for those of you who have cable and have noticed an increase in your bill, as I have, that has actually tripled in the past decade. Now, in your industry, in loan servicing, the cost of service loans has actually quadrupled in the last decade. In fact, few things have increased as dramatically in cost. Now, you shared with us earlier that continuing to service loans may simply not be economically feasible for you. It keeps you from focusing on your core business and limits your ability to growth. So we're here today because our core competency is exactly this, providing cost-effective loan services. And my goal today is to show you how partnering with us will allow you to focus on doing what you do best, and that is providing excellent services to your clients. So let's get started. And scene. So that's an example of cutting to the chase. I started with something personal my audience could relate to. I obviously found out some information in discovery that I reflected back to them and, and delivered some insight. And I addressed, it, addressed a current challenge they're having and introduced a benefit. So I think you can see why the audience is going to pay much closer attention to this type of an opening as opposed to the previous one. So let me share with you some tips on how to cut to the chase in your presentation. So what you want to do is you want to front load the most interesting part of your message. Too many people just hold back and, and that doesn't serve you any purpose and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. Think about patch, packaging it, that information in a story, a quote, or providing some visual support um, like I did there. And what you want to think about is piquing your audience's interest without giving it all away, kind of like a movie preview. So don't make the mistake of starting slow in your presentation. Make a strong first impression by cutting the chase. It'll let your audience know this is not the same old vendor presentation they're used to, and they'll listen much more attentively. All right, for this next fail, I'm going to call on a fantastic performer to introduce it for me. Mr. Jimmy Fallon. Now, I don't know how many of you are fans of Jimmy Fallon, but I'm a big fan, and one thing that he does extremely well is his monologue. It's clever and topical, it's short, it's interactive. In fact, he sets the bar pretty high for everybody else. Now, a monologue is simply a piece of content that's delivered by one presenter, and we see a lot of monologues in sales. Unfortunately, most of them look more like this. Right? And that's a fail. To be fair, delivering a monologue is exceptionally difficult, even for the pros. It's always easier to have somebody to interact off of. And that's why virtual presentations are so tough, because you don't have that interaction. But let me ask you a question. How often in your personal life do you stop and allow someone to speak to you for 5, 10, 15 minutes straight without some type of response or interaction? Unless you're taking a class or listening to a webinar or attending a speech, probably not too often. Yet that's exactly what happens in most sales presentations and even conversations today. And that's really at odds with how we communicate. So if you think about, you know, take yourself for example, uh, you know, texting, tweeting, um, emailing, everything's short. Even commercials have gotten shorter. Uh, I got an email the other day that was like, six paragraphs, and I thought, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, we just expect our communication to be in these short snippets. Um, even videos, the average uh, video time people will spend watching a video is around three minutes. So if you don't present your message in a way that takes into account how people communicate today, you're going to fail to make an impact. Now, the problem is you probably have a fair amount of content you want to share with your prospect. So what is the solution? Well, we have to find a way to avoid giving a bad monologue and, and find some ways to make it more engaging. So I'm going to share some tips with you here. The first one is to think about creating a dialogue with a silent scene partner. Let me give you a little secret from acting. There is really no such thing as a monologue. You are always engaged in a dialogue. It's it, it's just simply the, your scene partner doesn't have any lines. <laughs> so you, you want to think about, just because they don't have any verbal lines, you want to think about the fact that you're still in a conversation and you're still 
feeding off of what you think their thoughts are or how they're reacting. And when you're live, you can pick up on those nonverbal cues um, and react to them. So you're constantly adjusting your tone, your delivery, maybe even your words based on people's body language. Um, so take that into account. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to change what you're saying or, or, or ask them a question, but if you see somebody cross their arms, you might have to be a little more persuasive in your delivery. Oops. Leverage the pause. That is a very underused tool in sales. Um, a lot of times, uh, presentations seem like one long run-on sentence, and it's very hard to tell what's important and what's not. So use punctuation. When you make a strong point, put a period on it, not a comma. Let your audience absorb the impact of what you just said before you race on to the next point. And think about breaking your content into small chunks. Look through it and, um, and, and see where you can break it up, maybe with some interaction, which we'll talk about a little more later. So now what I want to do is I want to share an acting technique with you um, that's really handy, especially when you have to do a web presentation and are getting very little feedback from your audience and have a lot of content to get through. And that is called answering the unspoken questions. So I'm going to give you an example of, you know, just a, a typical monologue I might want to say in my presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, why people go with this is because of the mobile experience and why that's important. All right, so this could be very, very bland, and it could be one in, you know, part of a two-page monologue that I'm going through. So the way to break this up is to think about why am I saying this? What, what, is, what is the audience, what would they ask that would compel me to say this? So let's break that up. And my first line is, the reason why everyone decides to go with this is because of the mobile experience. Well, if I think the reason I'm saying that is because my prospect is is asking me, why do people choose your company? I'm going to answer that with a different intonation and, um, and vocal resonance. So I might say, well, the reason why everyone decides to go with this is the mobile experience. It's going to have a little more personality to it. This line, the reason why uh, this allows you man your managers to approve invoices from anywhere, anytime, which makes them more efficient and helps them to focus on what really matters. So I might think, well, my prospect might want to know, why is this important, right? And, and if I think that, I might answer it differently. So why is that important? Well, this allows your managers to approve invoices from anywhere, anytime, which makes them much more efficient and helps them to focus on what really matters. So I think you can see this is going to bring out more personality in your voice, and it's going to make you and your audience feel like you're engaged in the dialogue. So what you want to do is go through your presentation, look for the monologues, those long stretches of content in your presentation, and think about how you can break them up by applying some of these tools to turn them into a more engaging dialogue. I'm going to role play an example of a fail now that I see happening far too often. And it can take place anywhere in a presentation, but I'm going to role play this right after my opening um, as it talks, speaks to what I'm going to cover in my presentation. So I want you to be ready because uh, we're going to ask you what you think the fail is here at the end of it. Okay. And I, I'm going to show you this, the content afterwards, but I just want to deliver this because I probably would not have a slide necessarily as I said this. We help small to medium-sized companies like yours to drive down their human capital cost on services like benefits, workers' comp, risk and safety, taxes and payroll. And today we're going to show you how we can provide integrated, cost-effective HR solutions to handle your administrative HR duties, lower expenses, and increase profits. And scene. So I'm going to show you what uh, actually the copy was there so you can see what I just said. And there is a fail in there. And Krista, do you want to bring up that poll so you guys can decide what you think the fail is. Too many buzzwords, human capital, driving down costs, integrated, that could be boring, too much information. Pick the one that you think most applies. 
All right, I think we got everybody. I'm going to close the poll. Okay. What do we got here? Boring. Yep. Too much information. Absolutely. You guys are good. Too much information. Look at this. There are at least 10 points I've got in this, what, one sentence? Good grief. Uh, I'm already overwhelmed. So I may indeed be talking about all these things, but as a listener, uh, you know, you're just overwhelmed. It's like, wait a minute, wait, workers' comp or safety, handle administrative affairs. It, it's not consumer friendly, right? Um, if you overwhelm your audience initially, you're going to have a, a tough time getting them to pay attention. Uh, so j this fail is having too many messages. Now the problem is we are all bombarded with messages today, with information. We receive something like 3,000 messages a day. So we've actually gotten pretty good at tuning things out. So if you don't speak to someone's issues clearly and succinctly, they are going to tune you out. In their book, Made to Stick, Chip and Dan Heath introduced the concept of being sticky, which is having that top of mind recall and being remembered by your customers. And that's what we need in our presentations today, that's stickiness. And one thing that they said, I think, speaks to this point, the more we reduce the amount of information and idea, the stickier it will be. So in other words, more is not better. More is definitely not better in a presentation. And most experts agree on having one central idea as the core of your message in order to increase recall. And this is especially important as sales get more complex, there's more decision makers involved, buying cycles are longer, and your competition often has similar messaging. So how is your presentation going to be remembered? Chances are it's not if you throw too much data at them. So most presentations try to emphasize too many points, which has the effect of emphasizing nothing. So you need to decide what is that one thing you want your prospect to walk away with and try and reinforce that at strategic points within your presentation. So I'm going to give you an example of how we would fix this particular opening and make it speak more directly to one compelling idea and see what you think. And I'm going to share this with you, but I probably would not have this on a slide. I would talk to this, but I'll share it with you while I do it. So this is the fail, remember. It's short, right, but it is action-packed. So this is the fix. You know, like most of our customers, you probably didn't get into your business to be filling out forms, making time-consuming employee and benefits decisions, and managing risk and compliance. Today, we're going to talk about how we can help you get back to focusing on what you do best, growing your business. In a few minutes, I'll show you just how much time you'll be able to free up in your day to focus on the things that drive your business forward while providing you with even lower labor costs, Fortune 500 benefits, and a reduction in risk. And scene. So you can see that I made it more customer focused, especially here in the central area. Uh, and it's not just a list of topics. I honed in on one central idea that I want them to take away, which is we're going to help you focus on what you do best. That's what I want them to remember at the end of the day. So remember, more is not better. Too many messages dilute your primary message, and that can easily get you confused with your competition or forgotten entirely. For this fail, I want to share some interesting facts with you about how we receive communication. So this study was done, and it found that we receive a certain amount of uh, information from our body, from people's body language and a certain amount from their voice, just the sound, the tone, the quality of their voice, not necessarily, not the words, and then, of course, a certain amount from the words that they are using. Okay, so 38%, 55%, 7%, those are all associated, one is associated with each of these areas. So uh, I think Krista has a poll here to see what, what do you think, uh, what percentage comes from a person's body language? Is it 7? Is it 55? Is it 38 percent? Just from the body language, just how they hold themselves, how they move, their, their presence. All right, I think we have everybody. I'm going to close Ooh, the poll yes. in 3, 2, 1. You guys are quick. What do we got? 
Well, that's funny. 55% said 55%. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you guys are you guys are good. So let me share with you the results, and it is indeed 55% comes from your body language, 38% comes from your voice, and 7% from the words you say. Now let me just just kind of couch that with this. If your words are gibberish or <laughs> they don't make sense, it doesn't matter how great your body language is, right? So this is kind of a general rule, but think about what that means. 93% of what is happening here comes from your body language, the sound and quality of the tone in your voice, and not the words. Yet what do we spend 99% of our time preparing? Let's live it right here, right? And, and like I said, that is important, but there's a real advantage here for people that know, know this information. All right, so this fail is about focusing exclusively on content and making that do all the heavy lifting. You know, while a, a well-crafted message is a critical component of your presentation, you're overlooking some tools that can really help you differentiate yourself and stand out in a competitive market. So the fix is to start thinking like a performer and take advantage of some of the tools that you have right in your control. So I want to introduce you to three things, three areas that you, that you can control. You know, there's so many things in a presentation you don't have control over, so we want to really grab on and leverage the things that we can. So the first tool you have is your body, of course, and we just saw how important body language is, right? So you need to be at your best when you present, and that means you need to warm up. Actors don't wait till the curtain goes up to, you know, stretch and get ready to go. They're, they're already at 100%. Same with athletes, right? Um, you don't warm up on your audience. You use your breath. When people are not using their breath well and they're speaking at the edge of their breath or running out of breath, it makes us as an audience nervous subconsciously. And you want to be able to use your breath so you can communicate fully and freely. You want to relieve that tension. Tension is actually the number one deterrent to good communication because what that does is it obviously tightens everything up and it tightens up you up in a, a breath with your breath and also your body and you start to become very self-conscious and it, you just get more and more uncomfortable. So you need to get rid of that tension before your presentation. And you want to channel that energy. A lot of times people have nervous energy, and, and that's okay, and, and uh, I, I don't want to suggest that you want to get rid of that because that can actually hurt your performance, but you want to channel it in a positive way, and if you've ever been backstage before a performance, you will see actors moving around, stretching, jumping, you know, anything to keep that energy flowing because if you let it tighten up, again, it will, it will it will pull all of your energy in and you'll start to get more self-conscious and aware. So the body is a very important, important piece of your presentation. Then you have your voice. As we saw, 38% of what's communicated to your audience comes from just the sound, the quality, and the tone of your voice. Um, now, if you have a web presentation, what happens to that 38%? Well, that becomes even bigger, right? Because you don't have that physical presence as much. So you want to think about using your volume, um, changing up the pace, speaking very clearly, again, warming up beforehand so you're not tripping over your words, using your full range. You know, what's interesting is I will hear salespeople talk to their peers, talk to me in this very full range voice, lots of personality, and then they get up to do their presentation and it's very nice and it's the very, in this very narrow range I call that presenter mode. And it's really tough to listen to for any length of time. So you want to bring as much of your personality to your voice as possible, especially in a virtual presentation. So a lot of times you have to stretch that range because when you're nervous, the tendency is to, like I said, tighten up and things get smaller and narrower. The important thing to remember about all of this is to use variety. If you constantly speak at a loud volume, you're gonna, it's gonna be like a, fire hose coming at your audience, right? If you have a quick pace, you want to think about where can I slow down when I want to make a, 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 a strong point, right? So play with variety because humans very quickly adapt to patterns. 
And the last tool you have is your stage. Now that could be an office, a conference room, or in the case of a web demo, it's your computer screen, but it's your real estate. So have a plan for how you're going to use it. Think about movement, right? Don't stay stuck behind your laptop. You have permission to move about the room. <laughs> and if you don't, you know, if you're on uh, the screen, you're on a laptop, um, use your tools, right? Use your, your annotation tools. That is a type of movement and it's, it's very impactful in a presentation that rarely has much, um, much movement going on. So think about what you have access to. Use props. You know, there might be something uh, that would support a story that you're telling, that would help your ad audience understand your message. Maybe, maybe you have a model or a demonstration. Um, think about providing visual support. Most people are visual learners. And certainly most of us use slides, and that's great. That's kind of the price of injury. But they don't really have, uh, since everyone uses them, they don't have the dramatic impact that they used to. So strive for variety in visual, visual support as well. Think about using a whiteboard, a flip chart, um, to reinforce things that you want your audience to remember, like benefits, for example. So don't make the mistake of relying exclusively on your content. How you use your voice, your body, and your stage can make a big impact on your prospect. And when decisions are close, as they often are today, it can make the difference between winning and losing the deal. I could spend a whole hour alone on this fail, as it's a pretty large category, and it has to do with your slides. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example. I'm going to show you several examples. Uh, and this first one is, is a typical of a, a slide mistake that I might see. And here we go. So this might be early on in presentation, and I'm obviously laying out something I've maybe found out in discovery, some of the challenges that you've shared with us, and how we're going to improve those in different areas. But ultimately, this is a fail. And this is part of that category that I call committing slide crimes. And in other words, these slides are either having a negative impact on your audience or they're failing to achieve their purpose. So in this particular example, uh, there's several things <laughs> wrong here, but ultimately it's just really hard to read. There's not enough contrast. Um, it's visually distracted, distracting. I, I tried to do something maybe creative and uh, a lot of times that is the problem is that we try and get artsy and that, that undercuts readability. So we have, to, we have to balance that out. So here is that same information laid out in, I think, a much better way. A uh, couple things I've got going here that are an improvement, better contrast, added a little graphic point of reference for quick comprehension, improved the alignment, and by the way, if you're not great at spatial placement, which a lot of us aren't, there is a grid line feature you can use on PowerPoint that will help you line things up. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to show, I want to show you this slide, and now it's your turn. I want you to decide here what, what the fail is. So this is, you know, this is one of those company selfie slides, all about us, your global investment partner, so that's part of it. But just from a, a slide, viewing standpoint perspective, what do you think the fail is? And Krista, do you want to open that poll so they have a couple choices there? There you go. Okay. It's too busy. It's hard to read the font. No clear point, point to this slide. Again, what is, the, what is the major fail you think here? Answers are coming in and I think... Um, okay. Do we have a winner? Yeah, we got about everybody. I'm going to close and show the results. Okay. All right. Good. Too busy. Yep. Hard to read. Font. A little bit. No clear point to the slide. Absolutely. Um, that's probably the major problem here. It's, what, is this, what does this mean? What are you trying to tell me? The problem is, um, it's, what is the point? Who knows what's important here? And I bet you the presenter, nine times out of ten, is not even going to talk to all of these points. That's what typically happens. This is a marketing piece, this is a leave behind. So what is the fix? Well, 
eliminate all those things that don't speak to the point. I think the point of this slide is that we make a great investment partner because of these three points. And we're global and we have diverse products and diverse clients. So I can speak to this. Because what happens when you have a busy slide like this up there is part of your audience will be trying to read that and you may be, spe you may be trying to call out certain points and speaking to something else and already you've got split attention. So this I can speak to and guide you through this slide and not, not have your attention dispersed. Okay, give you another example here. So this is just a you know, very typical si slide. It's, it's a results of a study. I've got some, some statistics in there. And you know, it's, it's not terrible, it's readable. But I think there's a strong point in here that I'm failing to quickly grasp as an audience member. So I'm going to change that to a graph. So now I can, I can just quickly see, wow, 77% of my calls are going to voicemail or being hung up on. I'm only getting 9%, you know, 9% viable conversations. That jumps out at me. I don't need to you know, sift through the bullet points to, to get that idea. So it, you think about how many infographics we see now. They've really been, people have really grasped onto those because they quickly communicate often complex ideas. And so those can often best be shared by, by graphics. And if you're not great at graphics, there's lots of good uh, inexpensive services that can help you uh, turn, some, turn statistics and numbers into graphics pretty, pretty reasonably. Okay, so let me just share with you some best practices when it comes to slide design. My, my, I think primary one is here, there's one primary message per slide, right? Just think about what is, the, what is the purpose of this slide and everything in there should support that primary message. And, and if it doesn't, then put it on another slide. You're not, you're not charged per slide, so you can add more slides. <laughs> People will say, well, I don't want to have too many slides. I'd rather you have more slides. We're not counting the slides, but we are being very distracted by busy slides. Eliminate that clutter. Like I said, if it doesn't, you know, put it to the test. If it doesn't support your message, get rid of it. If you'd say, if you wouldn't read it, take it off, right? So many times people say, well, I don't read that. Well, then why is it on there is my question. So get rid of it. Um, ask yourself, is this a brochure or a slide? Avoid small type. Don't make it an eye test for your audience. So an 18 point minimum is usually good. And limit to six bullet points per page. And avoid those consecutive slides with bullet points. Okay, so again, these are general rules. Rules are always made to be broken. If you've got a creative idea that works, that's great. But this will keep you pretty, pretty safe and on track. So go through your deck, see where you're maybe committing a slide crime, and apply these best practices to them. I bet that you will find a lot of slides or information end up on the cutting room floor when you're done. This fail brings up a very important trend that you must address in your presentation or demo today if you're going to be successful. And I'm going to talk through this example. So uh, what I'll share with you is uh, I've done an introduction and now I've covered my agenda. Uh, this is an architectural uh, construction presentation and I've got my four topics and I'm going to talk about my first topic 10 minutes later still talking about that topic. 20 minutes later, still talking about the topic. What could be the fail? Well, similar to doing a long monologue, there's a lack of engagement and there's a lack of interaction. And why is that a problem? Well, I want to share a chart with you that um, talks about the life of an intention span. And this study shows that attention spans are really at their highest here in the first minute when you're speaking, and they drop off to their lowest point at 10 minutes. Now, unfortunately, that's when most presenters are just getting to the good stuff here, right? So if we don't do something to kind of keep spiking their attention, we're talking to a, an audience that is not paying rapt attention. So what's the answer? 
I love this proverb, proverb, I hear and I forget, I see and remember, I do and I understand. You know, the more prospects interact with us during our presentation, the more attentive they are and the more they remember and take away from our, our presentation. So the smart move is to have some way to, to keep their attention coming back to us because it's going to wane. It's natural for it to, to ebb and flow. The, the average human attention span length is about five minutes. So we need to do something to re-engage people. And a hook is a great way to do that. A hook is a device um, that can re-engage your, your audience if they happen to be drifting, drifting along. And here are some types of hooks that you can use in the presentation. Anything from a, a contest, a video, types of stories, polls, questions, props, movement, etc. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot these hooks on a pyramid, and I call this the audience engagement pyramid, because they have different, um, differing uh, uh, amounts of ability to, to engage your audience. So at the bottom here, kind of your entry point, right? It's like most people do slides and handouts. Not super engaging, but it's, it's better than nothing. And as you work your way up the pyramid, uh, more and more engaging. Well, if you've got them engaged in a contest, you've got audience participation, videos are especially strong as well, personal stories, those are real high-level engagement hooks. Um, so you can use this engagement period to think about how and when you need to re-engage your audience throughout your presentation. Again, so if we know our attention span falls to its lowest point in 10 minutes, it's a good idea to have a hook every five to seven minutes. That way you have a good chance of always having an adequate level of attention. Now one way that salespeople tell me, well, I keep my audience engaged by asking questions. And that's great, and I, you know, I encourage that. But lobbing a few questions out sporadically or asking unclear or leading questions can be worse than trying to interact at all. So I want to look at some fixes for making your presentation more interactive including how to make those questions work for you. First thing is plan those questions out ahead of time. Don't leave it to chance that you're going to come up with a brilliant question in the moment unless you like to sweat. <laughs> and odds are you'll wait too long to throw it out there. Wait for an answer. And this is so hard as a presenter because it can seem like that silence goes on forever. But do it. Because if you, if you answer your own questions from the beginning, you're going to have a hard time people for having people answer them as they go forward because they'll expect that it's a rhetorical question. So wait for that answer. Have a plant in the audience. Maybe you have a sponsor or a friend there or someone that you, know, you, you meet early before the presentation. Say, hey, I want to, I want to have a, a conversation about this and I'm going to ask this question. Could you maybe throw something out if we don't get a lot of response? Most people are more than happy to help. This is really important. Interact early and often. In those first few minutes of your presentation, you are teaching your audience how you expect them to participate. So if you wait until 20 minutes in to ask a question, you're going to get probably a lot of blank stares. Introduce variety. If you have a longer presentation, if it's uh, you know, an hour, two hours, I know people that have full day presentations, multi-day presentations, you need to have a lot of tools. If you, every five minutes, do some questions, you know, over two hours, that's going to get pretty old. So you need to mix it up. And what is helpful in that sense is creating what I call an engagement plan. And you don't want to leave it to chance. Now I have a, a planning tool, an engagement plan um, template, and I'm going to tell you uh, how to access it at the end of the, end of the presentation here today. But it's a great idea to just block in, okay, about five minutes in, after my agenda, I'm going to use this type of hook. Or after my first topic, then I'm going to ask this question. It keeps you on track, and it makes sure you have that consistently high level of engagement. So the bottom line is this. Don't let lack of engagement keep your message from being heard. Spend some time planning different ways to interact with your audience to keep that attention high. And you'll see your closing rate get higher as well. So there you have it. Those are all my top seven presentation fails and fixes. And in a minute, I'm going to share with you that uh, engagement tool that I mentioned and a couple other tools and how you can get those. 
Um, and we're going to, I think we have a little time for questions. So if you want to, if you have a question, please type that into the question box and Krista will, will pull those out and we'll take some time for those. Uh, but let me just share with you uh, where you can get these tools. So you can find out more about um, my program, uh, read my blog. I've got lots of articles on many of the topics that we discussed today at performancesalesandtraining.com. Now, if you go there and sign up for my newsletter, you will get this engagement planning tool as well as um, the engagement pyramid and some suggestions on different hooks to use in your, in your presentation. And I'll also keep you updated on new tips and trends in the world of sales presentations. So Krista, do we have some questions? Yeah, we have some questions and I have one too I'm going to ask. Um, Deborah was wondering if you talk about webinars in your book. I do, I do. I have a, a chapter on, on webinars and truthfully much of the book is, you know, the, the structure, the how to tell a story, how to be persuasive, uh, how to close. These all apply to webinars as well, but as far as the typical, you know, what do you, how do you do a webinar? Yes, definitely. How do you use your tools? Um, I just want to call out a couple things that Chris and I have done today. Um, you may have seen we've got the webcam going. I've also used some polls. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we use some polls. Um, you know, we the, the hardest thing about web presentations is what's really lacking is that presence, that connection with your audience. And we saw that, you know, your, your physical presence is 55% of what's communicated to another person. So you take that out of the picture and it's really tough to make that connection. The easiest way to replace that is to use a webcam. And I know so many salespeople, they roll their eyes when I say that. Uh, but truthfully, you know, and these are the same people, by the way, that will post selfies all over the internet. But for some reason, it brings up a lot of terror. But you can use it just at strategic points. I suggest using it at the opening of a presentation when your people are joining you, um, you're, you're connecting, and then at the end when you're taking questions or doing your closing. Right. So I have a question because it happened to me even at the beginning of this presentation, which is, I find it silly, but it always happens. I get nervous at the beginning and the beginning is so important and, you know, I rehearse and I go over it. And I know in my mind what I'm going to say and then I get up there and I forget what I'm going to say. My heart is, heart rate's increased and my breathing mm -hmm. is shallow. And so sure. how, do you have any tips? that we can do before the presentation starts to calm that down or to channel that energy in a certain way. Absolutely, and that's a really common problem. And, you know, like I said, don't expect that you're going to get rid of that. It's not a bad thing. And I think sometimes we just need to learn to embrace that. It's energy, and, it, and it's good, and it can be channeled in a positive way. So a couple things you can do ahead of time is I mean, I know that you prepare because I know that you, you do that in, in all your areas of, of business. Uh, but what you really want to have down is that first line. Um, because once you get that out, your practice, your preparation will kick in and your nerves will start to subside. So whatever you do, you want to really nail that first line. But I think what happens is we start to think, we start to take what I call our emotional temperature. Like, Oh, I'm breathing shallowly. Oh, I'm sort of hot. Oh, gosh, I'm nervous. We start thinking about ourselves. What I, what I try and think about is focus on, I want to, what do you want to communicate to your audience? Like, I'm, I call this your moment before. It's a, the actor's moment before. It's that moment before the curtain goes up. Um, you have something that you so want to communicate that you can't wait to tell, you can't wait to share it. So you don't have time to think about, oh, I have butterflies. I have, you know, you just think, God, oh. So I'm going to share with you the seven most deadly presentation fails, and I'm going to help you, you know, avoid these because it's important. So the more you focus on something outside of yourself and a purpose, the less you will be thinking about how you feel and those, those nerves. And yeah. then you'll, you know, get through that first moment, and, and then your practice will kick in. Right. I like that. Stay focused on the audience and not your own self. Right, right, because most of the things that we think people notice, like those little pauses or glitches in words, you know, people don't really notice unless you comment on it. 
So uh, it's kind of like the ice skater. I'm always so impressed with with the ice skaters in the Olympics. Like when they they fall and they just have to get back up and go right into their routine and do these beautiful jumps. They can't be thinking about the mistake they just made, or they won't be able to do that, right? So you got to just let it go and and keep going. We have a couple more questions here. Erica okay. is asking, how long? Um, Let's see, how long should the presentation be? Uh, I'm trying to, <laughs> sorry, trying to read okay. the, the client's connection, not only attention. So how long, basically, how long should the presentation be? And okay. For, you know. You know, I can tell you how long people can pay attention, but that doesn't always jive with how much information you have to get across. So the, the important thing is, whether it's a day presentation or an hour presentation, is that you break it into these chunks. So uh, the longest a, a person can really stay focused, attention to, uh, to someone speaking, is probably about 50 minutes. Now, if you think about it, that goes back to school, how long our classes were. That coincides with TV shows. So within 50 min 45, 50 minutes, certainly an hour, we expect a major change to take place. So so it's okay if you have a longer presentation, but, but with, in 15 minutes, you need to take a break. You need to really do a great hook that re-engages your audience and really changes the energy. Um, so that's, rather than thinking about I can only present for an hour because that can be very limiting if you've got a, a complex solution that you're sharing. Awesome. Well, given that, we've been on for exactly one hour. Oh, so okay. I think we can wrap it up. And I highly recommend everyone check out Julie's blog, subscribe to that, and get her books, and you'll definitely be able to improve your presentation skills. So thank you so much, Julie, for coming on and sharing with us about all thank the you, Krista. And fixes that you've seen in the field. You bet. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.